Welcome to another video from course SEG 2105. In this video, we're going to talk about some of the prerequisites to developing requirements. We're going to talk about domain analysis and making sure the problem is properly scoped. So, what is domain analysis? Well, domain analysis is all about making sure that all our developers have the background knowledge they need to develop the software. We talk about it as the process where a software engineer learns about the domain to better understand the problem. What are examples of domains? Domains include things like gaming, or Canadian income taxes, or maybe even a specific type of games, or a specific issue in income taxes. A domain expert is somebody who has knowledge of the field. They're not software engineers, they're some other kind of technology professional. They may be a, a gamer, they may be an artistic person who's good at developing the artistry within games, they may be a tax accountant, they may be a government tax collector for the types of domains we were talking about. If we talk about a university system, university student information systems are a field of business, a domain, and domain experts include the registrar staff in universities, the staff who work with students to help them register and the students and professors. So we want to do some domain analysis whenever you're setting out to develop a software system. An individual who's developing a software system by themselves, a team, a company, needs to have learnt the material. If you're part of a team you need to learn the material that the rest of the team has put together so that you can talk in the, in, in a, the same way as the other members of the team, with the customers, with each other, you, you know the language, you know the ideas. This allows for faster development, it allows you to create a better system with fewer bugs, it will better meet the needs of the users, and it also allows you to anticipate extensions, things that you might be able to do in future with this system, because you're not just working with the current requirements as defined. So these days, the best way to amass the knowledge for domain analysis is to create a web page. A wiki is a good way of doing it, where you put information about the domain, things that all members of this software engineering team need to learn. The eight things listed here, the eight topics listed here, are the kinds of things you probably should put on your wiki. What is this domain all about? What is this domain all about? A quick summary. A glossary of terms. Define all the terms that are of interest in this domain. Some general knowledge, background, things people should read, pointers to websites and documents people should read in order to learn about the domain. So for example, if it's uh, taxes, well, pointers to a summary of Canadian tax law, for example. The customers and users. Who are the people that will be using the system or might potentially buy the system? that we are developing. The environment. We don't mean by that the clouds and animals out there. What we mean by that is the technological environment. What other software will people be using? What hardware will people be running this software on? What networking environment will people have? What versions of the operating system? What versions of the database will people typically be using? Maybe they'll be using many different operating systems many different versions of the operating system. We need to know that. That needs to be documented. And also we need to think about where this is going in the future. And what other projects are also being developed at the same time. Our project will fit into some of those other projects. How do people currently do things manually? That's another part of domain analysis. What paper forms are used, for example? What competing software is out there? One of the things we want to do is look at that competing software, learn from it. We don't want to violate any patents or copyrights, but we do want to understand how other types of software solve the problem that we're dealing with. And similarities to other domains. So for example, if we're creating an emergency management system for fire, we might look at an emergency management system for the police, or for ambulances, in order to learn the kinds of things that they do. Now, when we're setting out to develop a project, we have to think, is it a type A, B, C, or D project? These are four 
types of projects. Type A projects are new projects, greenfield development, never before developed by us, starting from scratch, but yet we also don't know the requirements, so we have to go out and figure out those requirements. Type B projects are similar, except that the clients have produced requirements. We're still producing a new system, but the clients have produced requirements. Type C and D are the much more common projects where we already have an existing system. Type C projects, we have a problem to solve, but we don't yet have a list of requirements determined for those projects. We have to develop those. That's probably the ideal type of project to work on. Type D is an existing system, and the clients are presenting us with a list of changes they need already worked out, requirements already developed. The risk of type B and, B and D projects is that we don't actually know if those projects are, if, if those requirements are the kind of requirements that we actually want. There may need to be changes made to them, and there may be risks involved. So sometimes A and C are easier, because although we have more work to do, we, as professionals, can make sure we develop the right system. A problem in software engineering can be expressed as a difficulty. A difficulty might mean, in, in the context of a university system, students are having trouble registering. Students are not getting the courses they want. Or, it can be expressed as an opportunity. For example, to enable students to complete their degrees faster, to enable students to select courses that better meet their needs, or select courses that uh, will allow them to, to uh, go to graduate school, or something like that. And the solution to the problem will normally entail developing software. Remember, of course, however, that we don't always want to develop software. Sometimes, when we define the problem, we then realize that there is software that should be purchased instead, or adapted, which would be much more uh, amenable to solving the problem than spending a lot of money developing new software. The idea is to create a problem statement that is short and succinct, improving the university system to allow students to allow students greater satisfaction, for example, might be a problem statement. We also have to define the scope of the software. We want to make sure the software isn't trying to do too many things, at least initially. So, for example, we could start off with a very large scope, browsing courses, allocating rooms, registering, scheduling exams, fee payment, etc. And then later on, realize that, you know what, we should exclude some things. Maybe this is too broad. So we decide to exclude the room allocation. And then we also decide to exclude the exam scheduling. And then we decide, you know what, fee payment is handled by another system quite well. We'll exclude that too. And that brings us down to a narrower scope, browsing courses and registering. We also may decide to adjust repeatedly the goals a little bit, you know, to make them broader, make them narrower. So for example, rather than just registering, it might be registering in an, a set of courses that best reflects the student's career choice, or uh, allowing students to register in courses so that they can effectively have the prerequisites for courses they will need later on. In other words, we want to examine our goals and improve them in such a way as the system we develop will be better. That is the end of this small piece of lecture from SEG 2105.